why did you want to kind of bring it to this type of manufacturing setting? And why don't you think that it's used as frequently like in the traditional manufacturing space? Yeah, I, I well, I'd say that I can't speak to its usefulness within manufacturing specific. I think within a kind of industrial development setting, it has its advantages at times, but it doesn't always fit well. The farther upstream and kind of discovery or like more research-based science, that foundational approach has. Hey everyone, welcome to the It's a Material World podcast. I'm your co-host Puneet and joining me is my co-host David. So how's it going, David? What's new? Pretty good, pretty good. Not much, just uh, excited for the upcoming holiday weekend. I'm going to take a break and go see family. So super excited for that. What about you? It's nice. I'm not going home for the 4th of July, but I did just recently book a flight to see my family in August. So that'll be nice nice for sure. But yeah, I think what what we'll be doing is uh, I think we'll, we'll probably go to the beach, you know, so I'm excited about that. And that kind of ties in to the topic of today's episode, which is creating and commercializing ocean inspired sustainable fibers. So we interviewed Chris McKeel from Keel Labs, and we really just dove into he's he's the VP of R&D. And, you know, a lot of the talking points were that scaling up process and some of the challenges you face along the way, but then also methodologies and frameworks to continue to push forward, move the needle, et cetera. And also, you know, just create these bio-inspired sustainable products in the textile space. So just wanted to see if you had any highlights you wanted to share from from the episode. Yeah, no, I think that is really interesting to hear kind of his pipeline of when to do research, how to apply that research, and how to stay focused on that research. And so what I mean is that they are in the pilot stage as a company, so they have already proven at a lab scale and now they're trying to scale up more. And so I think it's really interesting to hear about how as they've grown, their focus has started to shift and divide and focus on not only the research at hand, but also some fundamental research, but knowing where to apply it to make sure they're not going out of their core competency. And so overall, I think it was just really interesting to pick the mind of the VP of R&D to understand exactly how he makes decisions, because I know a lot of the times, at least like if you're in an R&D company, sometimes the direction of the company might not be what you think might be the most optimal way. But hearing from him, it seems like there's a lot of thought into making sure that it's the most efficient. It is like the aligns with the core competency of the people that you already have, and then how to apply that to make sure that we can scale and meet all the timelines that we promised to the investors. So I thought that was super interesting to hear his point of view of how he decides exactly what is the pathway forward for a new novel technology. And he doesn't just create that pathway from scratch. I think what was fascinating to me is the frameworks and the methodologies that he's picked up from previous experiences and how he applies it here into, you know, that organizational scale up from lab-based, a pre-pilot, pilot pilot demonstration to commercial. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something maybe a bunch of people have maybe heard is like the agile and scrum methodologies, right? And those are more often used in in tech, software, et cetera. But it was really cool to see how he implemented those methodologies and frameworks into this type of setting. So I found that particularly interesting. And then also he just shared advice. You know, he ended up after graduating, he like was in the industry for a while, and then he decided to go back to school to get his, to go into graduate school. And so he shared the decision making and the thought process behind that, as well as really valuable advice and a unique perspective for you know our audience members that may be considering following a similar career path, the pros and cons of it. So there's a lot to dive into this episode. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hello, hello, everyone. So for today's episode, I'm happy to welcome this week's guest, Dr. Chris McKeel, the current Vice President of R&D at Keel Labs. 
which is a company that takes inspiration from the ocean to create bio-based fiber products. So Chris received his bachelor's in chemistry from the University of, at Buffalo, then went into industry for five years, focusing on chemical protection. Chris then went back and earned his PhD in fiber and polymer science from North Carolina State University, where he researched ways to improve PPE's resistance to hazardous chemicals. Since then, he's worked as a scientist, an engineer, and a director, culminating in his current role as the VP of R&D at Keel Labs. So Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah, we would love to start by just asking you a bit about your inspiration for working at Keel Labs to begin with. From what I could see, your background, even before Keel Labs, was in evaluating and improving the safety of PP. Could you briefly share what made you want to transition away from this over to the VP level role? Sure. I, so I've worked for over a decade within the PPE industry, and it it's a it's a great place to be involved in it. It feels noble. You're you're doing something that is really impacting people that are are helping to protect you, right? First responders, military police, and so it was great. It it's a very critical side of of science where it's evaluating things and holding them to a very high standard because they afford this level of protection or safety. And I always had, you know, throughout my time involved in that, I always had this kind of urge to be more on the product development side, the more kind of creative side of science, if you will. And even going back into grad school, I went in with that, that focus. And so after grad school transitioned into product development side of stuff and ended up at a biomaterials or a biotech startup that was using microbiology to reduce the carbon footprint or the environmental impact for cement applications, which I it kind of fell into. I got really lucky and it, it's an awesome space that I will probably stay in for the rest of my career if I had to guess. It's evolving rapidly and it led to this role that I have at Keel now. And it, it kind of aligns with the things that I just kind of value in general. I'm able to kind of solve old problems in, in new ways. I'm stealing from this upcoming or you know, continuously advancing biotech and biomaterials front and keep working to make industries greener in general. Awesome. So then let's kind of dive into where where you're at with, with Keel Labs right now. So in a previous call you kind of walked me through the process with in terms of scaling scaling up technologies, you know, and generally there's like a lap scale operation than pilot scale, right? One thing that was kind of new to me that you talked about was like the demonstrations, right? And then commercial. So can you just talk about Keel Labs technology, the focus right now, and then what stage in that that scaling up process you're at and what that means for, for your products as it is today? Sure. We, our main product is called Calcin. It's a seaweed based yarn. So we take a biopolymer, it's extracted from seaweed, and we spin it into yarn or thread for apparel applications. Uh, and it has a significantly lower environmental footprint than conventional fibers, uses much less water, doesn't have any harmful chemicals, it doesn't create any toxic byproducts. And so we're at the pilot scale currently, starting out lab scale, went to a pre-pilot, 10, 10 times uh, step up. And then our pilot is roughly 10 times greater than that. Side note, the scale of your pilot or your demonstration or commercial, it's all specific to your industry and your and your product type. So it's a, a little different for us. But our, our focus for 2024 is getting to a, a demonstration scale, which is the step rate before kind of a full commercial scale, or at least your preliminary commercial scale. Is that... When you say demonstration scale, like what does that mean? Is that like providing proof of concept to fundraisers or, you know, like people, like investors, stakeholders, or, you know, just internal proof of concept? What exactly does that mean? Yeah, that's a good, good point. I guess I, I didn't mention while, while you're scaling your, the, the main focus is not only to demonstrate the, kind of the proof of the concept and that feasibility of what you're trying to do, but you're really trying to de-risk the next level, you know? You try to solve as many problems at a smaller scale. So when you get to larger scales, it becomes cost prohibitive essentially, right? And you don't 
design yourself or engineer yourself into a corner that you can't kind of come back from. So demonstration scale is kind of the last step before we bring a commercial scale plant online. And it's meant not only to bring our products essentially to market at the at that scale, relatively small volumes by comparison to a commercial scale, but it's going through all of the motions of effectively running that commercial line at a much smaller scale where we can then very quickly go back to our pilot scale, troubleshoot problems, come up with solutions to those problems and implement those at the, the demo scale. So then as we go to scale in the future up to a commercial line, we're, we're, in, we're not or less likely, I should say, to, to run into kind of unanticipated so whatever that may be, it could be something as simple as you're just generating a lot of waste now. How are you going to deal with that rather than, you know, something specific to your product or your, your production process? So throughout all these different steps, the like general idea of your product doesn't change much, but the technology matures, I guess, do you have like any sense of like how the technology changes from step to step to step and how that kind of affects your R&D timeline as you try to like have this mature technology as ready as possible before you take the next step. Yeah. I, I mean, in an ideal scenario, everything works perfectly at the lab scale and it just perfectly transitions, right? But that's never the case. And something as simple as, as transferring liquids at the lab scale it takes seconds to dump one beaker into another. But when you're at a much larger scale, even at our pilot scale, it takes minutes or longer to transfer large vessels into another, right? And so a lot of the scaling is getting to that point of the material handling and the actual production process and what is going to come out the back end and how that's going to be treated before it gets sent out to customers or whatever type of downstream processing occurs. But the we follow the NASA's VRL technology readiness level system, which was something I we picked up at the, the last organization I was working for. And it's a way of kind of benchmarking or grading the state of your technology's readiness as by very definition. And it, it looks at it from this, what I found to be a unique perspective of essentially these little modules within your production process and the state of your pro product itself. And they don't all need to be perfect. Some of them can be lagging behind a little bit for a while, but eventually you get to TRL five or six. And the expectation is that those things are really starting to line up and performing the way that they should within their you know, anticipated environments that they're, they're going to be utilized in. And so those TRL levels align with your different scales from, you know, bench or lab scale to your pilot scale and your demonstration and commercial. And so it's a good way of tracking your progress. And it also allows for certain modules to be a little lagging a little bit farther behind in your development and then focusing your efforts on bringing that those that are lagging up to up to speed with the, the rest of your process. And once you get to the pilot scale, your the expectation really is that you have kind of all the pieces where they need to be. They may not be perfect, right? You're you understand that there's room to continue to develop and advance your technology, but you've got everything kind of lined up in the way that it's going to look when you are, you know, continuing to trans transition in the scale. Because again, you, you want it all in place so that you can start figuring out where the things fall off the rails, where things aren't working, and so you can address those very directly. So when we go through these steps, and you're just talking about these readiness levels, a lot of the time as we get further and further along the development pipeline, we need to balance the need for innovation and experimentation as questions can pop up, but sometimes we don't have the budget timeline or we won't reach our deliverable in time. How do you, as the VP of R&D, balance those two together to make sure that you still challenge and find the root cause of the largest issues while trying to be as efficient with your budget and timeline as possible? Yeah, timeline is always the trickier thing than budget, honestly. You can get more money, but you can't get enough time. And you're, that's the game that you're playing. So the main focus that I have at least when running my team is on is on is maintaining their focus on what we actually need to do to move the needle to get to that next step right i think that trl system does a great job of kind of highlighting where our focus needs to be in order to bring everything up onto that same you know plane 
effectively, right? But it's not a simple thing. There's no right answer. There's never a right answer. You're always making decisions based on the best data that you have available at the time. And you and so I surround just yourself ask. with people that will look at it very critically and objectively. And it's important from my side of things to keep the scientists kind of focused in the right direction. And it, it's very easy for for any scientist, including myself, and I'm speaking from experience here, to justify further experimentation and further you know, kind of deep dives into the technology. It, it justify it with data and, and real scientific justification. And that has to be balanced against like, we don't need to know everything. We don't need to build out this huge foundational body of, of knowledge. We just need to know these little pockets or pillars of information that are going to really move us in the right direction. And it's not, it's a very kind of at that level, it becomes somewhat subjective, at least in the way that I kind of prioritize things, but it, it's always aimed at a place of what's going to move, what can we do today that impacts us for tomorrow? That gives us a, you know, a positive outcome or, or a, a or further kind of enlightenment into what the, the problem may actually be. It's just like, I have a question from the leadership side, because there seems to be some leadership skills that, and management skills that factor into that, right? Like you said, scientists can continue to experiment, experiment, experiment. How do you provide that transparency and, you know, like create that focus of like, hey, here's our vision. Here's how we move the needle to get better day by day while also, you know, empowering your scientists and, and giving them the freedom to like continue to innovate? Like, how do you balance that and keep them like potentially on the quote unquote right track to continue to move the needle? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. it it's not a trivial thing, honestly, from a, a leadership thing. And if I had not worked with really great leaders in the past, it's probably not something that I, I would have had any exposure to. But within Keel, i brought up with me a development scheme that is based partly on like the agile scrum framework. It's really popular in the, the tech side of things. And it's very popular within the biotech world as well. It's, I think the main advantage to that approach, and I'll, I'll go into a little detail on kind of what that looks like is it, it keeps you intentionally you feel a little bit behind behind the eight ball at times. You're 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 kind of caught off guard, and you're it keeps you from diving too deep and overthinking a problem. And so I'll explain why I and this is my interpretation of it, right? So don't don't quote me here, but it's we we run our our development cycles in these short sprints, typically around two weeks long or so, and we give about a week ahead of time to do some prep work and some planning and to kind of build out the experimental approach that we're going to use. But effectively, when you're doing science, complicated, you, you know, very even fundamental type of work, two weeks is not a lot of time, right? It, you can only do so much in two weeks. But if I approach my team and say, like, here is the finish line, this is where we need to get to. I don't care what the path is on how we get there, you know, for the most part, right? We've got to stay inside of some general guidelines, but for the most part, I don't care how we get there. We just need to get there. And it takes a lot of, at least when I was the, a scientist in that world, it felt like it took a lot of pressure out of trying to come up with some new novel solution. The novelty becomes in what can you do with what you have on hand right now, to try to address that problem or trying to provide some additional understanding to that problem so that the next development cycle, we can address it a little bit more clearly, a little bit more directly. And in doing so, we, we generate all of this information in a very short period of time. We sit down, we look at it very critically and objectively in these retrospectives to get an understanding of the true state of the technology after our most recent development round. And then we plan and we do it again. It becomes very iterative and very cyclical. And it's a very large, or a huge difference from the way I'd say academia traditionally kind of teaches problem solving and the approach to problem solving, which is, as I mentioned before, kind of this more of a foundational approach. Like let's keep building more and more of this theoretical information and that'll provide us some comfort when something unknown happens. Like we've we'll, we'll already known all of the different you know, you know reactions or interactions there. And that's just really not true when you're doing something that's brand new, cutting edge, you are always faced with something that your 
theoretical or traditional sciences kind of fall off of because there's just a lot of compounding factors and, and error and things that creep in there that you can't account for. And so you're, at least from my perspective, you're almost better off kind of going into these new situations somewhat blind and then figuring out a quick fix on the fly because it's going to enlighten one way or the other, whether it works or not, it's going to enlighten the world around you and provide a clear path of which direction really is feasible versus those that are just cliffs that there's no further advancing in that direction, or we could probably go this other direction, but it's going to be an uphill battle. And that, again, it's not about whether we can figure something out scientifically, because given enough money and time, we could do anything, right? It's more of, can we figure out something in the short amount of time that we have so that we can keep moving the needle forward? So, okay. So I have a question there because we don't see like agile and scrum methodologies used as frequently in like traditional manufacturing settings. We see it in tech, as you mentioned, a lot more frequently. You've taken this from, from previous experiences and applied it here. What have, like, what results have you seen for, you know, without diving into proprietary information, but why did you want to kind of bring it to this type of manufacturing setting and why don't you think that it's used as frequently like in the traditional manufacturing space? Yeah, I, I, well, I'd say that I can't speak to its usefulness within manufacturing specific. I think within a kind of industrial development setting, it has its advantages at times, but it doesn't always fit well. The farther upstream and kind of discovery or like more research-based science that foundational approach has advantages, right? Because you're doing, you're, you're inherently just so unknown that there aren't the constraints around your development in order to kind of keep you in point in the right direction. You're just trying to figure something brand new out. And then development kind of comes in after that fact, and you can start to really run things in a more iterative approach. It's for me, it was when I first got exposure to it on a product development team. I was, it was the first time in my career that I was like, this is kind of this corporate jargon or this, I don't know how, how management style, if you will, that was like, this is really beneficial. It's really useful. It was like a, a fundamental shift for me in the way that I viewed problem solving. And it, it gave me this comfort of like, oh, I don't need to know everything. I don't even need to really dive super deep into some of these tops. It, it placed so much more emphasis on the goal and the end game of what you're trying to do and less on this kind of guessing it right the first time in, in the way that you would, you know, kind of traditionally set up these larger experiments that are going to, you know, hopefully pay dividends on the back end with, with tangible developments. And that's not necessarily the case, as I was saying before, at least in my experience, it's rarely the case. And that's, I, that's what I use it for more than anything is to break my team away from that very academic approach and that mindset of like, we need to set up this really complicated series of experiments that's going to play off of each other. Because when you're trying to do stuff and you're trying to do it fast, stuff always goes wrong. And so if you've got two weeks and something goes wrong, you've got two weeks around the corner. But if you spend six months doing this complicated experiment and then you get nothing out the other end, you've just lost six months, right? It, you, you can't get that time back and you're not necessarily any closer to doing what you set out to do, you know, six months prior. So when we talk about larger organizations, usually they kind of do the fundamental research while they also do like the most pressing issues that you're talking about. But as you're a startup, you don't have the luxury. I guess when you start to grow into these different phases, how can you start to segment where you focus on and divide up people? I guess the bigger question here is how can you effectively say, okay, I'm okay to start to away people from the pressing issues and start building up this fundamental knowledge again so that we can solve any larger issues down the road or work, work on new products or augmentations of what we have currently to apply to a different field we want to tackle. Yeah. So we actually do, you know, I think early stage startups where Keel was, you know, a, a year or two years ago, it's a little different story. You're, you're, you're limited on money and the number of people that you have working with you and whatnot, right? Where I've, I mean, after our, our series A, we've got a much wider scope of what we're trying to accomplish. And so we're running simultaneously our kind of foundational research, our, our 
upstream development. We're, we're running that with product development, process development, and then now we're just getting to the point of building out an application development team. And the difference, obviously, the upstream development is very material focused and the product and process kind of work hand in hand to so get you the product that you want and then also building out what will turn into this robust manufacturing process along the way. And those two really have to happen simultaneously. You can get to a good place with product development on its own, especially at a lab scale, but it really doesn't mean a lot without having this manufacturing process on the other side, because that's the thing that has to scale more than anything else. I, I shouldn't say more than anything else. Obviously, any incoming raw material, those, they're all related, right? But those things work hand in hand. You focus heavy on your process and getting it to a point where it is use the term again, robust and working the way that you need it so that you can use it as a test bed for refining material developments that are coming out from the upstream and you know how that impacts the actual product itself. And then on the other end of it, the place that we're just getting to now is application development, which is taking that product and building out its performance properties as they relate to its intended use case in the application that it's going to be you know employed within. So for for us within yarns, textiles, that's things from how frequently can someone wash and wear this this textile that is made out of our material, how is it dye, what are you know all these performance properties, and they're much more specific to the, the use of that product than the product itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And I want to dive into that a little bit more. So like you just touched on, right, Keel Labs is exploring ways to, to use seaweed to make environmentally friendly fibers and yarns with applications in textiles. So can you describe some of those challenges that you're facing with using a material that naturally include, like it occurs in a different environment, like, you know, a marine environment and then versus what you're trying to use it in, which is the textile applications. And maybe also touch on kind of the innovations that you need to leverage to overcome those sorts of challenges. Yeah, and that's, I think, an inherent difficulty with this biotech, biomaterial world. You're you're taking something that itself has incredible properties, for all intents and purposes, perfect for what it's intended to do within the environment, right? And within millions of years of evolution to create these, you know, seaweeds, basically, that we're now taking this polymer out. And that polymer is specific to that seaweed, right? It's meant to provide a structural element for this thing to grow. And we're trying to take it and use it in a very different application outside of that marine environment, like you mentioned. And that becomes the tricky part is, is modifying the natural, these naturally occurring materials so that their performance properties, they they match for the intended use within the, that application that becomes difficult, especially when you're approaching it from this sustainability mindset where it's it's not good enough to just do this in a way where we're out the other end, we're just filling up some landfill. We want to take advantage of that natural decomposition type of property, you know, within these materials. Uh, and so we don't want to modify it so far that it's effectively, you know, another plastic, you know, building up in the environment. And so there is some inherent difficulty there, but I will say what works to our advantage is, you know, a uh, hundred years or more of, of advances in the physical sciences and, and especially from chemistry and, and polymer chemistry in general, we can steal from that. We're working with a different polymer, but it's still polymer and we can uh, approach solving some of those problems in that, in that manner. And so there's this bridge between kind of the, the old way of approaching solving these problems and then incorporating these new biotech or, or biomaterial approaches. And it, it's exciting. It's like we, we can do more very quickly with a biomaterial than we could if we were trying to engineer or design a polymer to work in that exact same way. Cool. All right. So I just had a question there with, from, the, from the product development standpoint, specifically with like bio-inspired materials. Like what, so this is a question kind of just putting myself in the shoes of, of your, your scientists or you know, even like, let's say the next generation of material scientists, how does that, like, what does that innovation look like? Does it, does it require, you know, how much is it like looking at other polymers and seeing how those technologies have developed and seeing like what bits and pieces can apply to this space where it's bio-inspired technologies 
versus just like completely kind of thinking out of the box and work like you know this is a this is a different space than traditional polymer development processes so i'm just curious from that standpoint like what how what your sci scientists like thought processes look like and what their experiments look like to whatever detail you're comfortable talking about it yeah i, I mean i think we all lean really heavily into what we've done previously and and what we kind of hold true from that regard you know and i have confidence in my ability to do this thing and so if i have to solve a problem i may leverage that thing or you know that that characteristic as, as much as possible and i don't think we necessarily discourage kind of nascent you know innovation i think it what happens is is more of a practicality of we just have very limited time and to go and invent you know some new glimmerization technique or something to complement this this biomaterial it's just unrealistic and that that type of you know nascent in innovation is is really best suited for academia or academia academic institutions and so we're much more applied much more practical in our approach for the most part until we reach a place in which we just can't move forward with the way that we would you know typically or traditionally approach it and then it becomes a question of what's the value gain right like are if we really cannot move forward without inventing some new complementary technology for what we're doing, it, it may be fully worth it and justified, right? There, there's no reason that you can't do that. It's just a matter of, is that a battle that you want to fight? Is that time and resources that you want to dedicate to that? Or is there another way that you can get to, again, that kind of finish line or that goal that you're searching for without having to fight that, that uphill battle? And so it's, yeah, I, I don't think there's a, a great answer here. It's it's kind of this this trade off over time, but you really want to try and grab as much off the shelf, simple solutions as possible because it's just so much faster. Sure, I this is very much a, a general question that this this idea of like I could like this might be something that you know is focused on an academic setting, and so this isn't specific to Keel Labs, but just maybe wanted to to get your opinion from the R and D perspective, but. I was just wondering, like, how do companies decide, like, oh, you know, I want to partner with, you know, a local university and, you know, provide a grant or something so that they can really do a deep dive into, let's say, a, like developing a new polymerization technique versus like investing with an, an internal R&D lab or, you know, hiring additional R&D scientists and, and doing all of that internally. You know, I've seen both of them, yeah. right, or even sometimes a mixture. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on how that decision arises i think for a more you know larger more established company it's a lot easier to build a business case around growing out that fundamental research internally and you can support that through ongoing sales right and it becomes much easier to do within the earlier stage companies smaller companies right even if you're not necessarily a startup anymore and you're just smaller it's just very cost prohibitive and it takes a very long time and the reality of research is that you're not guaranteed to get out what you put into it, right? You can put millions or billions of dollars into a subject matter and not necessarily get something out that's worth millions or billions of dollars itself. But if everyone, you know, the collective academic mindset is doing that same thing, there really is a collective advancement of that science, right? And so that's, that's where that world kind of contributes to that ever kind of growing state of the art. For us internally, the way that it's been explained to me in the past is that within industry or smaller scale companies, research has very little place there. This is a development and not research. And if you have the opportunity, you partner with a research organization, they're going to be better at it. It's going to be essentially putting your money in a, in a place and investing it with a return that is not only specific to advancements in that material, or that science that you're trying to move forward, but also the people that are working on it. You can get a lot of very specifically focused new grads right out of school that are, you couldn't hire that person otherwise, right? Like they're going to have a, such a unique skill set that's directly related to the work that you're doing that's incredibly beneficial. So there's a lot of value from, from our perspective in finding a, a research organization and, and working with them for the more early stage kind of fundamental development that 
or research that needs to occur. But that being said, like timelines are very different and you know, academia is, is inherently much slower. They tend to be more thorough, of course, in their approach, it's much more broad. So there's, you know, pros and cons with it across the board, but for a small company, it's, it's usually cost prohibitive to, you know, invest very heavily in that type of stuff. It's just the reality of it. And so you start bringing in revenue to support it. It's a, just a difficult thing to justify. So now that you've talked about these core competencies and kind of your focus on development, how do you start to scale to a completely different application of the same technology? So maybe to be a little bit more focused, right now your technology is focused on textiles. What are the general ideas for how this technology can make it impact in other areas? And then using this pipeline that you've laid out for us through the episode, how do you kind of foresee trying to like develop into different areas than just textiles? That's a good question. And that is a tricky road to navigate in all reality. The way that we're approaching it here is effectively we're working within a, a textile application and specifically within an apparel application, right? There's a huge world of textiles outside of clothing. So we're focused on clothing and, and apparel. What the easiest inroad more than likely is other textile products that are we traditionally call like text technical textiles in some form or fashion, right? We can start to assess our material or our products. I shouldn't say product. It's really like technologies fit within those other applications uh, and start to look for kind of inroads to see if, if that's easy or not, right? You can start to lay out the application constraints for those specific new, you know, potential deviations in your, in your product, your, your technologies platform and say, you know, start checking off those boxes. Yes, our material can do this. It can't do this, or it could do this if we put a little bit more time in you know, investigating it. You can start to really see the landscape around the world that you're developing your material for. What is important is ensuring that that aligns with the business case on the other side. As I mentioned before, it's very easy from a science perspective to justify further development in one direction or another. We get super excited about cool advances and we're like, can start just snowballing this idea of like, well, if it did this, we can do this and more than we're in this other product category. And if we don't have on the business side, an alignment that allows us to kind of easily move our path forward there, it's almost as if that development didn't happen. And if that took development took time and resources, that's being diverted or, you know, just essentially a distraction from other areas that we can really, you know, tangibly achieve in, in an easier fashion, right? So the the quickest you know additional application for your technology is something in a very adjacent area it may not be specific it, it may be you know subtle deviation to your your manufacturing process ideally no deviation to your manufacturing process you're just kind of using it in a different application but there there's still this platform of advancement in our core technology that has potentially unlimited you know usefulness in a variety of of other applications. And so the the trick is just aligning that strategy from advancing the science with advancing the business side of it. Do we, are there existing relationships that we can leverage from our current development partners that are also in this other space that we can very quickly kind of move things along and ensure that on the other end of all the development, we have somebody that's going to pay for what we just developed and made, right? And that becomes the the tricky part of it. And it's also the side at which the lower level, like youngest kind of scientists and engineers, they don't really get that level of transparency. They don't really get to see it. And if, if you don't understand that and you think that decisions are just being made in this kind of blind fashion, it's, you can be, and I've been in this, this situation of like holding this advancement that I'm like, this is like an incredible thing. This opportunity is insane. And then to have, you know, someone in the upper management be like, yeah, we can't do that. That's not going to work. Like it, just for very practical reasons. Like we don't have any experience here. We don't have any partners or relationships in this area or, you know, I guess a little bit more of a tangible or practical limitation would be the existing infrastructure in that industry doesn't support our production process. And that is a hard sell to try and change the way in which a lot of your, your you know, existing materials are, are manufactured because that manufacturing process and the products that are on the market have a level of competence in their performance. And if you're not 
kind of pigging back, piggybacking off of that ex, you know, that production process and the inherent confidence and comfort that's built on it. It's really difficult on the other end to get people to buy into any of this this new material, and that becomes a really challenging thing. And at times, you you have to face it, and you just have to kind of like continue to build confidence with you know what ends up being your your customers or the consumers of your material. But it's certainly a, a more of an uphill battle than if you kind of just be a drop in replacement for some you know existing material within their existing manufacturing footprint. Well, yeah, thanks for the thing. It's very interesting to hear about how, like, you think about moving forward, especially like from an R and D company. But maybe to wrap up today, we just want to ask you a bit about your professional journey. So you made the decision to go back to school after being in the industry for a while. Something that we've really seen in all the other people that we've talked to on the show. Could you briefly share what made you want to go back to school and any advice you would have for people that are considering the same career path as you? Sure. Yeah, I. So I left undergrad. I was planning on going to grad school. Actually, I was already basically enrolled to continue on. That was always the plan. And I was just kind of done with being a broke college kid and decided to go out in industry. But that was very, very early. I recognized that that was a mistake. The type of roles that I wanted to be in, the level of impact or influence that I wanted to have on the work that I was doing was just beyond my reach because of you know a lack of letters after my name, at least at that time is what it felt like. But I think it's more than that. In reality, it's kind of a refinement in your scientific kind of understanding and approach and, you know, even just the basics of experimental design and project management. You you gain all of that through grad school and you don't really recognize you're even doing it. You're just kind of focused on the science. But I coming out of grad or undergrad, excuse me, I was I was like at a place of I was working in a pharma in quality control and I, I was like, if this is what a chemist does, I don't want to be a chemist anymore. Like I, I was just looking for any other opportunity because I was just so bored. And I felt like I, I had spent so much time in school through my entire life learning all of this critical thinking and problem solving skills that I just didn't even use, right? Like I was just doing the same thing over and over again. And so that that kind of started this path of like, I, I have to go back to grad school one way or the other. I left pharma shortly after that and got into the, the PPE industry and was able to have a, a good amount of impact in that world. And it kept me kind of satisfied and kept me moving forward. And that led me to to NC State. So they actually brought me down with the with the ability to to go to grad school, but really as a focus of working full time within the, the center that I was working for at that time to build out their chemical and biological testing capabilities within that center. And so I was working full time and doing grad school, and then I had my oldest daughter, and so I had all this stuff simultaneously happening. It was it was a lot, but kind of coming out of or really going into grad school, I I knew I wanted to transition toward that product development side of things, like that more creative side of of the science, and really structured even my dissertation in that manner. If you read through the, the different like chapters of my dissertation, it, it really Although it was under this PPE kind of title and umbrella, it was much more focused on demonstrating all of the technical areas that I had competency in and things that I could see myself working on in the future. And that in itself is something I, I think is an incredible like learning opportunity for anyone that's in school right now is the more of your projects that you can kind of own and customize to your liking, you're going to put more effort into it. It's going to be genuinely better. And the the ultimate test for your dissertation is not just to get that diploma at the other end of it. Someone's going to be hiring you, whether it's in academia or in, within industry, and you need to speak very competently on the work that you did and the level of kind of technical understanding and enthusiasm that you have for the work that you did is going to be directly related to your kind of involvement in kind of creating that processing approach in general. And that's not always an easy thing, especially you know a master's level pro- program, I imagine, or even some some other ones that end up being a little bit more kind of not necessarily dictated, but curated more so than than what mine was specifically. But it's I think it's important to get a broad exposure, especially nowadays. The development is it's very multi multifaceted, and I never thought I'd have any use for any biology in my life, and then I found myself working in a sea of biologists, microbiologists, and, and doing this really complicated 
biotech approach to making cement using microbes and and then now I'm, I'm on this other end of using a bio-based material, but it's still in this world of like, you're having to navigate in a subject that area that I didn't necessarily dive too deep in when I was in school. So I think that's another thing kind of takeaway is like the more broad your understanding is science as a whole, the more effective that you're going to be in problem solving when you move on, you know, outside of school. And when you're in school, university or, or whatever, that's the time to do that, right? Like that, it's a lot harder to do to kind of continue your education once you're in industry because as i mentioned throughout this you know our discussion here it's very very focused on on making things move forward and it's governed heavily by you know, essentially financial interests and, and their value that it's going to bring back i love that thank you so much for sharing that perspective and just in general for sharing you know the progress that keel labs has made i'm super excited to see your company continue to grow. So I just wanted to extend that gratitude and we appreciate you coming on the show today. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.